what we're seeing is the eradication of DC as we know it. A new voice in filmmaking. They know emotional honesty when they see it, and they know, you know, when they don't. It's important that we don't create with any of that in mind. How he got his big break. What's the film about? These white folks gonna paint over the city like we never existed. You experience gentrification in the day-to-day kind of interactions with people. And... Hey, is this your truck? Yeah. Turn the music down. The music's too loud. Don't make me have to call the cops. Semi-autobiographical, is that fair to say? Semi would be putting it lightly. Is he the next big thing? At the very least, it is a archive of my community. Filmmaker Marari Garima. Marari Garima, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me, Carlos. My pleasure, totally my pleasure. And where are you today? Are you in DC or are you somewhere else? Nah, I'm actually in Chicago right now with my fiance. She's from out here, so we go back and forth a whole lot. I'll be back in D.C. in a couple of days, actually. Oh, I love that. You're bringing the nation together. Okay, I like yeah. that. I thought you would have yeah, stayed in right. D.C., but that's pretty good. I like that. Residue is the new film written and directed by Marari Garima. These white folks going to paint over the city like we never existed. The powerful film, which saw huge success on the film festival circuit and now streaming on Netflix, confronts issues of identity, gentrification, and loss. Hey, is this your truck? Yeah. Turn the music down. The music's too loud. Don't make me have to call the cops. Hey, tell me a little bit about Residue. For people who've never seen the film yet, obviously just out on Netflix, congratulations. No small accomplishment. What's the film about? Residue is about a young man who comes home to Washington, D.C. Uh, in order to write a script and to make a film about his neighborhood, you know, his childhood, the way he grew up. And when he arrives, basically, he, uh, he finds that things have changed beyond recognition, beyond his control, you know, beyond, um, you know, his ability to really uh, reconcile. And so he's really struggling to reconnect to his neighborhood. One, to tell a story, but two, just to kind of, you know, figure out what the hell happened, you know. And it's semi-autobiographical, is that fair to say? Semi would be putting it lightly. Uh, I think at a certain point it was semi, <laughs> you know, and while I was writing it, you know, it was semi, but once we started filming, it became pointless to even act like it wasn't about me because we were filming in my neighborhood, you know, where I grew up. We were filming the people I grew up with. They were in front of the camera and behind the camera. We were filming in the locations that I grew up with or where I was raised. P put it in context for people who haven't seen it yet. Um, this reminds you, or this may remind them, maybe better said, of what other films? What is this? Give this a little context. What other films is this now a part of? Yeah, Crooklyn is, is a big one, you know, to me, one of, one of Spike's best films. You know, it's, it's similar process, you know, you can see him trying to, uh, you know, scrambling to really kind of put all these memories of all things that happened in his childhood into this film to kind of give you an idea, you know, chasing this feeling of, um, you know, this nostalgic feeling of childhood, you know, growing up in Brooklyn kind of a thing. And gentrification obviously plays a big role. Is that because, again, I'm assuming you saw that happen? up close and personal in DC, or were there other things that made you grab onto the theme and kind of feel like focus it around that question of gentrification? Well, you know, I think that, you know, you'd be hard pressed to tell a story in DC at this point in time, you know what I mean, without that being a major theme. Uh, because, you know, what we're seeing is, you know, basically the eradication of DC as we know it, you know? And I think that um, that's kind of what prompted the project. I had, I had been away in film school for about a year um, and then, you know, I had known gentrification was happening and I'd already been mad about it, but to see how much had changed in one year um, was devastating, you know what I mean? I think that that really set me on the path of like, all right, you know, I gotta do something. On the ground kind of uh, level, you experience gentrification in the day-to-day -day kind of interactions with people and, you know, you know, one building goes down, another one comes up and, you know, kind of, you don't, you're not really aware of how all these forces outside of your, you know, perspective impact your life, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. But once I started down this path of making this film and just kind of, you know, educating myself, the more, you know, you see, you start to see how layered it is. But at the same time, you also start to just get a sense that it is tied up in every other, you know, form of oppression that black people face anyway, you know what I mean? 
because like now I'm at the point where I, I, I really don't differentiate between gentrification and police brutality, you know, because the police really act like a cleanup crew, you know, just kind of sweeping through, you know what I mean, and just preparing the environment for this new population, you know. Robert, take me, uh, take me down the road a little bit. Where would you love to be five years, 10 years, 20 years out? Uh, give me the vision, tell me the story. I would love to be, you know, um, pushing far, you know, helping, you know, Ava and, you know, kind of this push that she's created, you know, just doing my part for that movement, you know, in the, in the industry, you know, bringing black stories to life. DC is just bursting at the seams with stories, untold stories. Ava DuVernay is the highest grossing black woman director in American box office history. Her film distribution company, Array, was named one of Fast Company's most innovative companies. Array amplifies the work of people of color, like Marari, and women of all backgrounds. Tell me a little bit about the process of making the film, though, because if I understand correctly, it wasn't a continuous, let's go shoot for 60 days, for 90 days, and make a film. It got broken up a little bit, is that right? I share with you just a, um, a really nice moment which happened before we started filming. Dad was just sidelines, you know, he just kind of watching from a distance. And he was just like, you know, like, <laughs> he was like, you know, it's not looking good. It's not looking good. Right. But he was like, but you know, that's actually a blessing, you know, it's kind of a blessing because he said the urgency of this production will find its way into the film. So just allow the imperfections to happen. You know, just let it seep through into the project. And that's what we needed because literally everything went wrong. But because we had this mindset of we still here, we still filming, and it's not gonna be a perfect product. And these imperfections and catastrophes can be folded into some type of beauty, you know, for the film. It's actually gifts in disguise. You know, for me, it's like the project, if, if Netflix never happened, if these reviews never happened, if nothing ever happened, at the very least, it is a archive of my community. You know, it is a record of our existence, you know? The you've been dreaming about this car since you were eight policy from American Family Insurance. you get into filmmaking uh does that come in the blood or how did you how did you get into filmmaking yeah man you know my both my parents are are you know black independent filmmakers my father is Haile Garima he's Ethiopian filmmaker his biggest film is you know it's called Sankofa that came out back in the 90s about basically revolution and slavery times you know Yeah, man, it's, it goes back, man, it's deep because, uh, you know, honest to goodness, like my first memories that I can recall is in Jamaica, you know, where they were filming that film, you know. There's photos where he was on set directing, holding me as a baby, you know what I mean? How did your folks meet? How did they come across each other? Man, Howard University. Um, my dad, he graduated film school at UCLA and the first job he ever took was they had just started a film program at Howard. And he was like, <laughs> all his friends was like going, you know, to like other institutions. And he was like, oh, you mean I get to go teach black kids at the first, you know, film, you know, program in the country? Even though, you know, it's paying less, you know, he was like, hell yeah. So he packed up everything, drove from LA to DC. And he taught there for 40 years, man. He was, he was a film professor for 40 years. Yeah, he just retired recently. Were you one of his students? Like, did he actively teach you? Or were you just always taking it in at the dinner table? I think more so the latter, you know. Um, when I got older, I sat in on some of his classes, but now nah, when I, I did go to Howard University, but I was studying graphic design. I was, honestly, I was actively trying not to do film. You know what I mean? Because people in your I ear- I was going to say, I you was going to say. People in your ear like, oh, yeah. you're going to follow in your father's footsteps, right? right? You know, which is the last, right, right, you know, that's the right. fastest way to get a rebellious young boy, you know what I mean? To not do something. 
What about your mom? I mean, when you guys sit around now, I mean, there must be extraordinary pride to see you and to see your journey if you're them. Do you talk more work with your mom or work with your dad? Like, who do you? My mother is an incredible filmmaker as well. In fact, you know, is an incredible cinematographer. Both of them, you know, have their ways of interacting with their son who's in film. And we watch many cuts together, you know, and they give really critical, you know, they 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 won't be nice just because you're their son, you know what I mean? To the point where sometimes I'm like, dang, <laughs> you know, that's how y'all feel, you know what I mean? But it, it's the type of like rigorous engagement that like, uh, I think is so necessary for, for the arts, you know what I mean? I'm sure getting a film on Netflix is no small achievement. I'm sure there are lots of highs and lows. I'm sure people are always asking you for advice. What do you say to young filmmakers when they're asking you, how do I dream fearlessly? I think it's important, especially for filmmakers, especially for, for black filmmakers, to understand that like we had no expectations of Netflix, distribution, slam dance, where we had our premiere at. Um, we, did our, we did our best to not think about any of that, any of that. And I say that because I went to school, you know, with a lot of filmmakers, you know, who, you know, they they start writing with a Sundance deadline in mind. You know what I mean? They're like, I want to start writing so that we can start shooting by this point so that the film will be done and edited in time for the Sundance deadline submission, you know, whatever. And I just feel like, what a way, you know what I mean, to just, um, handicap your whole creative process, you know what I mean? And I just feel like um, the juries aren't dummies anyway, you know? They know emotional honesty when they see it and they know, you know, when they don't. And so I think that it's important that we don't create with any of that in mind, any of it, you know? But, you know, I wanna say that like, it's also important to contextualize this, you know, this whole thing. Because Ava DuVernay and Array are really a singular entity in the film world. This did not exist, you know, at the time that my parents was out there fighting to like get these films made and distributed, you know, them and their contemporaries. Now that Ava exists, who in many ways she sees herself also as continuing the work of that generation of filmmakers, you know, of really standing in that legacy, you know, because they really kind of created the conditions for her to kind of come up in this, in, this, um, in this film industry in the way that she is. Small outfit, massive impact, you know what I mean? The type of work that they do, you know, with the type of resources that they have is mind blowing. It's insane, really. If anybody wants to know how this is all possible, it's really through the, you know, kind of Herculean effort of generations of, of black filmmakers. And I, I, think it's, I think it's amazing and I'm just, I feel so blessed to be on this journey with them. Let me try a little rapid fire with you. You mind if I do a little rapid fire with you? I'm terrible at it, but go for it. Your favorite book or one of your favorite books? I'm terrible at it, man. Oh, uh, Invisible Man, Ralph Ellison. A little Ralph Ellison, that never hurts. You've mentioned already a couple of the directors that you admire, but give me one more that you haven't mentioned yet. Whose work do you admire? Man, there's this incredible Japanese filmmaker. His name is Shinsuke Ogawa. This man, back in the day, him and his crew lived and bought this rice farm. Lived there for 13 years, making this documentary about rice in this community. And just incorporated the whole kind of mythology of the community into this. You would never think that a documentary about rice could just be this amazing, but it incorporated this thousands years history and mythology of this community. The last time you were scared or afraid? That's all the time, you know? I'm always worried about, you know, kind of, um, you know, my family, especially in this moment, you know, it's hard not to be, you know. This whole thing with Breonna Taylor really had me just kind of like, man, you know, uh, it's hard to see, you know, into the future and know what's going on, but you just know that like, whatever does come, you have to be prepared for it, whatever that means. Man, I am, I'm, I'm so glad uh, that I met you and I'm so glad that you came on the show and I hope it won't be the last time Carlos, yo, thank you so much for, for having me, man. The feelings are mutual. You know, this has been an incredible conversation. You know, I feel like I've known you a long time now. 
you know, and uh, yeah, um, I'm, I'm very happy to have been here and I, I definitely look forward to, to some more in the future, man. Hey, I really hope you enjoyed meeting Marawi Garima. Uh, I'm a new fan, a big fan. I felt like I've met a really special young person just at the beginning of what I hope will be a beautiful ride. So many different uh, memories and images and other interesting people came to my mind as I met him. Ava DuVernay, obviously, but also other people. Uh, I'm excited to be a part of his journey. I love who his dad and mom are. I love that he talked about not just himself, but a larger tribe of friends and family who he's, he said he's linking arms with. Very interesting uh, to hear him talk about his personal journey and really allowing it to be a journey about himself and not trying to run away from that, not trying to hide from that. Um, I hope you enjoyed it too. And if you do, I hope that you'll not only subscribe and tell friends and listen to the podcast, but I hope you'll go watch his film. I think it's important that we support this film, Residue. So check it out on Netflix. If you like it, tell other people about it. And, uh, and tell me what other young filmmakers we should be introducing you to. Hope to see you soon. Thanks for joining. Hey, tune into The Carlos Watson Show. It's like no other. You're going to enjoy it every weekday on YouTube.